I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we'll start with the good. The PROMISE trial has showed us that maternal treatment during pregnancy and breastfeeding can reduce transmission to nearly 1%. Peripartum transmission was significantly lower with maternal treatment, 0.6% compared to 1.8% with antepartum AZT single-dose nevirapine, and postnatal transmission was very low with either infant nevirapine or maternal treatment, 0.8% with nevirapine, 0.7% with maternal treatment. And you put these together, and you have an overall transmission rate with treatment of only 1.3% at 24 months in a breastfeeding population. Oh, don't get stuck. There we go. Um, antiretroviral duration affects efficacy with longer treatment being more effective. These are data from the French perinatal cohort. They evaluated association of transmission with timing of treatment and delivery viral load. And for women starting treatment during pregnancy, duration was clearly critically important. Uh, starting in the third trimester was considerably less effective than starting in the first or second trimester, 2.2% transmission versus 0.4 and 0.9% transmission. However, regardless of duration, the lowest transmission rate was with the lowest delivery viral load. Well, there we go, kind of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Preconception treatment had the greatest efficacy. There were no infections in 2,651 women who were on ART preconception and had sustained RNA less than 50 through delivery. However, even if you're on preconception treatment, you do see transmission at a higher viral load at delivery. There's been a remarkable increase in women receiving treatment during pregnancy, 44% in 2010, 82% in 2018. And this has been accompanied by a 63% decline in new child infections globally, 450,000, almost half a million in 2000, 160,000 in 2018. And transmission in high resource formula feeding settings are currently 1% or less. And this is an example from the United Kingdom National Study of HIV in Pregnancy and Childhood. Transmission was 2.1% in the year 2000 and had decreased to 0.27%. Only seven infected infants between 2012 and 2014 in the United Kingdom. Hmm, there we go. Nope. Can you go back one? All right, I'll go back one. Okay. Well, 60% of the women were on, <laughs> there we go, 60% of the women were on treatment at conception, 87% had delivery RNA less than 50, and amazingly, those with um, uh, delivery RNA less than 50, the overall transmission rate was only 0.14%. And even in low resource breastfeeding settings, there's been a significant decline in transmission overall. These are data from South Africa, 17.3% transmission in 2008, 4.1% in 2019. The largest decline was in peripartum infections shown in purple. And of the new infections that occurred in 2019, 75% were estimated to have occurred postnatally through breastfeeding. So let's talk about the bad. While coverage of uh, pregnant women with treatment has increased significantly, it varies significantly by region, as you can see on this slide, 56% in Asia, 59% West and Central Africa, only 28% in the Middle East and North America, North Africa compared to 92% in East and Southern Africa. So I showed you this slide. There's been a slowing of decline, but uh, there's been a decline, but there's been significantly slow. Most of the decline in transmission occurred between 2004 to 2012, 5.2% per year. 
Since 2015, this has slowed to a slope of 3.9% per year. We've missed our 2018 and we're going to miss our 2020 targets of 40,000 and 20,000 new infections. And if we continue at this current rate of decline, it's going to take us more than 22 years to reach our target of 20,000. Pregnancy in the peripartum period is a time of high risk for HIV acquisition for women. These are data on pregnancy and seroconversion from two prevention studies, over 2,700 HIV uninfected women. And it shows you the adjusted probability of transmission per thousand condomless sex acts. And you can see that the relative risk of acquiring HIV per sex act was significantly increased in late pregnancy, second and third trimester, and the early postpartum period through six months compared to the non-pregnant, non-postpartum period in gray. This increased transmission risk per sex act translates into high rates of incident infection during pregnancy and postpartum. These are data from a meta-analysis of 19 studies in Africa. The uh, seroconversion rate during pregnancy, 4.7% per year. Postpartum, 2.9% per year. Overall, 3.8% per year. So pregnancy and postpartum constitute periods of substantial risk for acquisition of HIV by women as defined by the WHO for the need for PrEP of 3% per year. Incident HIV during pregnancy and breastfeeding is associated with an increased risk of transmission. And these are data from a national survey in South Africa. 28% of almost 10,000 women were positive, of whom 6.7% seroconverted during pregnancy. And you can see the transmission rate with chronic HIV was 2.2% compared to 10.7% with incident HIV. So although incident HIV occurred in only 6.7% of women, incident HIV accounted for 26% of all early transmission. So global elimination of new pediatric infection is not going to be possible without eliminating incident infection in pregnant and postpartum women. A significant proportion of women on treatment experience viral rebound postpartum. The top uh, graphs show the National Study of HIV in Pregnancy and Childhood in the UK. In women who conceived on treatment, there was a 10.7% rebound by 12 months postpartum. In women who started treatment during pregnancy, they had a 37.1% rebound by 12 months postpartum. And we saw very similar data in South Africa. This is 523 women starting treatment during pregnancy, had initial viral suppression to less than 50. 31% had viral load greater than 1,000 one or more times in red by 12 months postpartum. This shows you the primary factors related to new child infections divided up into pregnancy and breastfeeding. And in orange, you see incident infection. Yellow is no treatment. Gray is stopping treatment. And blue is either late treatment or viremia on treatment. Very slow movement there. <laughs> OK. Globally, primary missed uh, opportunities are no treatment, which means either the mother wasn't tested or she was tested but not started on treatment. And this was followed by incident infection and stopping treatment, poor retention. But there are significant country differences in these missed opportunities. And if we look at the DRC, the primary missed opportunity is not testing or not starting on treatment. Whereas in Malawi, the primary reason for infection is incident infection. So we need to target our interventions to the local epidemiology. For example, in the DRC, you need to invest in better identification of women and better support for treatment. Uh, whereas in Malawi, investment in PrEP programs to avoid incident infections would likely be more effective. 
With the success of PMTCT, we see an increasing number of children exposed to HIV in treatment but uninfected, 15 million in 2018. And in countries with high HIV prevalence among pregnant women, the proportion of children who are HEU is significantly high. 20 to 30 percent of all children born in Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, and South Africa are HIV exposed and uninfected. That's the good news. This is slow and not working. Can you go back? Uh, okay, there we go. So these HIV and ART exposed uninfected children may have excess morbidity and mortality. And on the left, uh, you see a study from Zimbabwe that looked at hygiene and nutrition that had HIV exposed and unexposed children. The 18-month mortality was 40% higher among the HIV exposed uninfected children in red than the unexposed children in blue. And on the other side, you see a meta-analysis of 12 studies where HIV exposed uninfected children had a 20% increase in the risk of acute diarrhea, 30% increase in the risk of pneumonia compared to unexposed, un unexposed children. Okay, the ugly. Adverse pregnancy outcome differs between treatment regimens, and we've learned this from observational data from two different studies in Botswana. This is looking at HIV-positive women on different preconception treatment regimens, dilutegravir, afavirenz, nevirapine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and you can see that for any adverse outcome and any severe outcome, the outcomes were worse with nevirapine and lopinavir compared to afavirenz or dilutegravir. However, regardless of the treatment regimen, pregnancy outcomes in women, even on, with HIV on treatment, are worse than women without HIV, as shown here in blue, even for dilutegravir and efavirenz. The Tisamo study showed us that preconception dilutegravir may be associated with neural tube defects. This shows you the evolution of neural tube defect prevalence over time from the first report in May 2018 to March 2019. And with the latest data, the prevalence is 0.3%. And this compares with other non dilutegravir preconception, efavirenz preconception, and HIV uninfected women. You can see those have stayed a straight line, and it's significantly lower than with preconception dilutegravir exposure. Now, this shows you a table of all published and presented data on NTDs with preconception dilutegravir. And I've separated this into countries with food folate fortification at the bottom and no food folate fortification at the top because the prevalence of neural tube defects varies between that. So if we look at no food folate fortification, preconception dilutegravir had a neural tube defect prevalence of 6 out of 2031 for an estimate of 0.36%, and this compares with a pooled prevalence in the general population of about 0.1%. And in countries with food folate fortification, we had one neural tube defects out of 847 exposures, weighted estimate of 0.12%, and this compares with the general population prevalence of 0.06%. So we can't really draw definitive conclusions yet. Surveillance is ongoing, both in the Botswana study, the antiretroviral pregnancy registry. More data will be available. And as dilutegravir gets rolled out, we'll have data from birth surveillance programs in Malawi, Uganda, and hopefully Eswatini. But what we can conclude is that neural tube defect risk, if real, appears to be significantly under 1%. And with risk-benefit analyses showing substantial dilutegravir benefit in women of childbearing potential, the WHO now recommends dilutegravir as preferred for all individuals, including women of childbearing age and those who are pregnant. So what have we learned? 
Over the past decade, we've learned a great deal about how to prevent mother-to-child transmission, and our substantial successes had led to the aspiration that we could potentially eliminate new pediatric infection in the upcoming decade. However, we've also learned we can't be complacent about our successes. Progress has slowed, primarily due to implementation challenges, such as the need to improve identification of infected women and to support them to remain on treatment and suppressed, as well as continued incident infection in women. And this defines our research priorities over the next decade. Thank you very much.